Tony, I want to ask you about something that one of your new colleagues put on Twitter over the weekend. Uh, Representative Ilhan Omar of Minnesota, freshly elected member of Congress from that state, she did some retweets where she talked about what many people perceive to be as Jewish money. Glenn Greenwald of The Intercept put out a note that says uh, Republican leader Kevin McCarthy threatens punishment for Ilhan, Minnesota, and Rashida over their criticisms of Israel. It's stunning how much time the U.S. political leaders uh, spend defending foreign nations, even if it means attacking free speech rights of Americans. She put out a statement that said, it's all about the Benjamins, baby. Now, people look at that and say, is there a member of Congress, a Democratic member of Congress here saying that somehow Jewish money is controlling thought? A new shutdown clock is ticking. Members of a bipartisan conference committee say talks about border security have broken down with just four days. Could another government shutdown be a reality on Friday? Joining me now is Democratic Congressman Dan Kildee. He's the chief deputy whip on the Ways and Means Committee as well. Congressman, thank you so much for being with us. Our understanding is that Democrats want to limit the number of beds that ICE can have in this country for people detained or arrested in the interior. Why is that important? Well, because, first of all, a budget is a statement of priorities. These are budget debates. And what we've been saying all along is that we don't want the, this administration to use those detention beds uh, as a way of punishing people who come to this country seeking asylum or somehow seeking safe haven. They've been doing that. We want them to prioritize the use of those beds for people who are dangerous. And this is all being negotiated in the context of the president asking for something that we question. And we think that, as he has said, if we're willing to negotiate, they ought to be willing to consider some of our priorities in order for him to get some of his priorities met. That's been the discussion over the last several days. I spoke to one of the conferees on Saturday. He felt like progress was being made and there was good faith discussion of this very subject. But now um, perhaps the, the president's sending signals that it's not something that he will accept. I hope that we can kind of Put, you know, put aside some of these differences, come to some middle ground. Republicans are going to have to accept the fact there might be something that is included in this agreement they don't like. We will have to accept the fact that there could be something that we don't like. That's the nature of compromise. Is this issue for you, though, the number of beds that ICE can, can detain uh, undocumented immigrants, is that a hill worth dying on? Is that in and of itself worth the shutdown, if that's a holdup? Well, look, I mean, the president and Republicans have indicated that they're willing to give on some area that's important to us. This is the one where the negotiation has sort of led to. So it's important that we, if we're going to have a balanced agreement that some of our priorities are adhered to, if they have some other uh, suggestion as to what they would like to offer that would give us some progress on a number of the issues that we're worried about in terms of immigration policy, this is one of them and it's a really important one. But if they have other ideas, uh, they should bring them forward. So this isn't it. You're not saying do or die on this. Take it or leave it. Well, I don't want to get ahead of the conferees. They're, they're trying to work this out. I, all I can say is this is a priority for us. The president has, I think, abused, and I think many of us believe this, abused the ability to detain people who are not a danger, but to do it in a way that is intended essentially to be punitive uh, to those people who are I, I coming here to Republicans seek Republicans uh, have apparently safe said, harbor. though, that, okay, we'll limit the number, but uh, not for violent criminals. Violent criminals, there will be no limit for that number. Would that be okay? The issue that we've been raising is the number of beds that are available, mm -hmm. forcing the, the administration to prioritize the use of those beds, which we naturally believe would force right. them to be used for actual people who, who may present some sort of risk or danger. Gotcha. And before, you were saying that Democrats are giving on issues that are important to the president. Do I take that to mean that at this point, Democrats will provide some new funding for new border barriers? That's been the focus of the discussion. And many of us have signaled for some time that as long as it's reasonable and as long as it's supported by the professionals that we're willing to give and maybe go further than we otherwise would, if in fact this is a true good faith negotiation gotcha. where some of the priorities that we care about will be, will be addressed as well. Congressman, I want to ask you about something that one of your new colleagues put on Twitter over the weekend. Uh, Representative Ilhan Omar of Minnesota, freshly elected member of Congress from that state, 
she did some retweets where she talked about what many people perceive to be as Jewish money. Glenn Greenwald of The Intercept put out a note that says uh, Republican leader Kevin McCarthy threatens punishment for Ilhan Minnesota and Rashida over their criticisms of Israel. It's stunning how much time the U.S. political leaders uh, spend defending foreign nations, even if it means attacking free speech rights of Americans. She put out a statement that said, it's all about the Benjamins, baby. Now, people look at that and say, is there a member of Congress, a Democratic member of Congress here, saying that somehow Jewish money is controlling thought? Well, I haven't seen those comments, and obviously that's not something that I would uh, agree with or associate myself with. I assume she's using the vernacular saying it's just about money. Right. But that's um, the, is know, it, Unfortunately, it, it, in Washington... There are people who look at that and say that's the problem here. What she's insinuating or implying directly is that Jewish money is somehow controlling certain Democrats and people's positions toward Israel. And there are those who look at that and say, isn't that just like saying George Soros is pulling the strings here or Michael Bloomberg is pulling the strings here? Veiled anti-Semitism, they'll note. I wouldn't take it as anti-Semitism. I would say that she probably objects to the fact that when it comes to issues around foreign policy or when it comes to issues specifically to Israel, there are a lot of interests, a lot of folks who, who make campaign contributions based on a person's position on Israel. I think it'd be, we ought to be careful not to construe that in anything other than a concern about the fact that money has undue influence on political decision making. I, I, I know, uh, Congresswoman Omar, I don't believe uh, that, that, that she would harbor those sorts of views as they've been characterized, but obviously it's a problem that she sees uh, that she wants to address. But I don't think we should go too far in trying to uh, make judgments about whether there's some anti-Semitism involved in that. She just may object to the fact right. that too much money Look, is involved in these decisions. Congressman Max Rose from New York said, when someone uses hateful and offensive tropes and words against people of any faith, I will not be silent. Congresswoman Omar's statements are deeply hurtful to Jews, including myself, uh, he went on to say, but that's not something you don't feel that Congressman Rose is right? Well, I haven't seen the comments okay. or the statements, so I, I ought not go too far in trying to make judgments about it. But I know both of those members of Congress, and I know they to be, them to be uh, good people. I just think sometimes we ought to uh, tamp down a bit of the rhetoric when characterizing what people are saying and not make assumptions that take us too far. You are on the Ways and Means Committee. There were interesting hearings last week about the president's tax returns. There are some on the left who think that uh, the, the chairman of the Ways and Means Committee, Richard Yale, is waiting too long to go after those returns. What's the holdup? Well, I don't think there is a holdup. Uh, this is uncharted territory. Uh, we have not seen the use of this law to, uh, to obtain access to presidential tax returns because for the last half decade, candidates and uh, presidents have voluntarily released mm. Those records. We have to lay the legal foundation to use this tool to access those records and, and make the factual mm -hmm. basis for why they are important, why they're in the public interest. I know that Chairman Neal is taking this very seriously. Mm -hmm. I know he intends to make this request, but we have to do it right mm -hmm. because the president's going to oppose this mm -hmm. and we assume he'll challenge it as far as he can. We need to make sure that we're doing this in the proper fashion so that we don't miss the opportunity mm -hmm. to actually get uh, our hands on these returns and reveal for the public, if it's necessary, what the president's interests truly are, to make sure that his public decision-making mm -hmm. is not affected by his private interests. I understand. I wanted to give you a chance to mark a, a huge passing for your state and the country, Congressman John Dingell, who will be laid to rest this week in Michigan. Uh, obviously a towering figure in, in Michigan state politics. What will be your en enduring memories of the congressman? Well, it was just an incredible honor to serve with him side by side in my first term. I've known him you know, virtually all of my life. The impact that he has had on American politics is tremendous. But I think mostly it's marked by the people he brought into the political process. I can't tell you how many people I've met who said that they either worked for Congressman Dingell or interned for him and were moved to stay in politics, to stay in government because they saw that you can be a good person and still be in this business. And um, obviously my heart goes out to, mm -hmm. to my colleague, Congresswoman Debbie Dingell, his wife who succeeded him. She continues his legacy in many ways, uh, but I know it's a really tough time for the family and I, I hope they find some peace in all of the great memories that people are sharing about Congressman Dingell in the, in the last few days. Decades of memories, I think decades of laughs and smiles and also legislative accomplishment.
Congressman Dan Kildee, great to have you with us. For Appreciate sure. it. Allison. All right, John.